Hello and welcome to Nature Knowledge. This is a speaker series with experts sharing scientific knowledge on current issues affecting nature in Florida. I'm your host, Dr. Shelley Johnson, State Specialized Agent in Natural Resources with University of Florida IFAS Extension. Thanks for joining us today. So today's topic is saving Florida's seagrass for bay scallops. And our uh, expert speaker for today is Dr. Savannah Berry. I'm very happy to have her here. She's a um, wealth of knowledge on this topic. She's the Regional Specialized Agent in Coastal Ecosystems with U of IFS Extension, Florida Sea Grant, and the Nature Coast Biological Station. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen, Savannah, and I will go ahead and let you um, share your slides. All right, great. So I'm so happy to be here um, because I have been watching these webinars uh, move forward and you've had such a great lineup of speakers. So I'm just really happy to be to be amongst those. And um, I won't be able to monitor the chat while I'm talking. So Shelly will be taking care of that, but do definitely feel free to, to type your questions in as we move through. Um, so as Shelly already said, I'm gonna be talking about seagrass and scallops, two things I'm very personally passionate about. And one of the reasons is because this is one of the first things I saw when I moved to Florida. This is a picture I took when I was a brand new graduate student in Tom Fraser's lab at the University of Florida. And I was really having a hard time adjusting to Florida. I'm originally from Virginia. And um, really, once I got a look at the seagrass that we have off of the Nature Coast area near Homosassa and Crystal River, um, it really changed my perspective. And it, it started me on the journey to becoming a, a Floridian or at least a, a transplant Floridian for life. And it's these little Easter eggs we call bay scallops that are nestled in this beautiful green background of seagrass and this species happens to be turtle grass. Um, but I was already very passionate about seagrass coming from Virginia, but the seagrasses down here are just a whole nother story from what we've got in Virginia in terms of the diversity and the base gallop fishery, which unfortunately was lost from Virginia due to loss of seagrass. So we'll talk a little bit about how the the intersection of base gallops and seagrass is, is in play in terms of mutual threats that they have. Uh, but first, I want to really talk about what seagrass actually is, because I hear a lot of misuse of the term seagrass. A lot of times I'll see, I'll hear people even refer to marsh grass as seagrass. So seagrasses are these plants, uh, the right side of this diagram. They are flowering plants. They are uh, actually derived from land plants. We call them the land plants that return to the sea. And their closest relative is actually lilies. So they're not even, a they're a distant cousin of your lawn grass. They're not a, a direct cousin of them. So they're flowering plants that have a fully developed root and rhizome system that actually allows them to take up nutrients from the sediment. And uh, they have uh, these vascular structures that we think of a more complex or a higher plant having. Um, this stands in contrast to algae, which would be on the left side of this diagram, which are a much simpler type of body form, and they actually don't have the ability to translocate gases or nutrients between their tissues. So even though some algae might look like they have roots, they're actually just, um, you know, an anchoring system and they don't have the ability to actually translocate, which is what sets seagrasses apart. So algae are actually taking up nutrients directly from the water column right into their cell walls, whereas seagrasses are, are again, they're drawing on the nutrient pool that's in the sediment. And this is a really important distinction because even though this picture is showing macroalgae or large algae that kind of look like plants, uh, we also have microalgae in the water column and both kinds of algae the competitive advantage is really shifted towards them when we have high nutrients in the water column because they're taking it up directly from the water. Whereas the seagrasses thrive when we have lower nutrients because we have clearer water so they can get light and they can also access that pool of nutrients that's down there in the sediment. Um, so when you say seaweed, you're really referring to algae. And when you say seagrass, you're referring to these plants that are living fully submerged, not emergent like marsh grass sticking out of the water. Um, so I just always like to get us all on the same page about what we mean when we say seagrass. 
All right, so a little bit more about the biology of seagrasses. Uh, some of these points I've already covered, but I like to go into more detail about some of the cooler aspects that maybe people haven't thought about. So they, they live fully submerged in salt water. They're a very, very small number of plants that can tolerate salt. And there's an even smaller number of plants that can tolerate living fully submerged in salt water. So they're extremely special plants and they, they have a lot of adaptations that make them able to survive in that very harsh environment. We already covered that they're flowering plants, but I wanted to show you a close up of what a seagrass flower looks like. The color is enhanced somewhat on this picture. They are not actually that bright pink, but it's just to, to help you see it a little bit better. Um, this is the flower of turtle grass, which is one of our main meadow forming species that we have in Florida. And seagrasses, while they have a lot of uh, advantages, they also have some disadvantages. And one of them is that they really require a lot of light to be reaching the bottom. And they don't do well at all if there are conditions that interrupt the, the penetration of light all the way to the bottom. So they can get easily outcompeted by algae or other things that A, don't need as much light to survive, and B, can kind of grow in a floating form and shade out the seagrasses. So those costly below ground structures are what contributes to the fact that they really need to gather a lot of light in order to survive, because after all, they are plants, so they have to be able to photosynthesize. Uh, I want to drill down a little bit more on this issue of seagrass flowers. I, I think that a lot of people find this really cool and in, unless you have really good eyesight and you've looked really closely at seagrass during the right time of year, most people have not ever actually seen this for themselves. So maybe next time you go snorkeling or when you go scalloping, you can have a look. Uh, the seagrasses should be flowering and fruiting right around this time of year in Florida, uh, the turtle grass that is. So uh, this again is a turtle grass flower and we used to have a joke in seagrass ecology where we would always say well there's no underwater bees that pollinate them and we would tell you know a funny story or at least we thought it was funny you guys are probably rolling your eyes right now uh, but we would talk about how the pollen is transferred by the water currents and things like that but then in 2012 a study came out that made it impossible for us to tell that joke anymore um, because there's actually been evidence that small marine invertebrates like the one circled here this is an amphipod small marine invertebrates can actually carry po particles of pollen from male flowers to female flowers and again this is shown in in turtle grass but the more they've looked into this issue the more they've started to see that there maybe is some possibility that there are underwater pollinators, although they still believe that the majority of seagrass flowers are pollinated by uh, water currents. So anyway, I just wanted to spend some extra time on that because I think that a lot of people find that pretty fascinating. All right, so a little bit more about the diversity and the location of seagrasses that we have here in Florida. Uh, there are six true seagrasses and there, there's a little diagram showing kind of how to identify them. We don't have time to go in depth, but across the top row are the main meadow forming species, the turtle grass, manatee grass, and shoal grass. And then below that are all some very small seagrass species, all in the genus Halophila. We've got Johnson's grass, star grass, and paddle grass. And the three of those are much smaller species that tend to either live in the understory or in deeper areas offshore because they have lower light requirements than the other larger seagrass species that tend to form these big carpets that we think about. And we're, we're really fortunate in Florida that we are a very seagrass rich state. So I've uh, listed on here the, the three largest seagrass meadows that we have in the state. Florida Bay is thought to be the largest in North America, the largest seagrass meadow. And then the Big Bend or the Nature Coast region is the second largest seagrass meadow in Florida and also in North America. So we have the two largest seagrass beds in all of the country, uh, and for several countries actually, which is really excellent. And the Indian River Lagoon has a significant amount of bottom that used to be colonized by seagrass, but they've really seen drastic declines in seagrass coverage in recent years due to algal blooms and other things. But historically, the IRL was another major reserve of seagrass resources. And then of course, you can see throughout the state, we have fringing seagrass meadows all around and a lot of that has to do with the amount of shallow water that we have where light penetrates to the bottom. 
Um, so the reason we're lucky to have so much seagrass in Florida is because it does a lot for us. I mean, we started off this program by talking about the monetary value of all of the different things that seagrasses are doing. So I'll cover a couple of those. So the first, and this is the one that most people know just intuitively, is that seagrasses provide habitat and foraging area for a, a huge diversity of species. So, you know, versus a sand flat or a mud flat, they create a lot of complex structure, they create a lot of substrate for things to settle on. And so they really increase biodiversity by a lot in our marine areas. And I, I put a little picture there of a, a, a baby scallop settle, settling on seagrass blades and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But there are several other things that seagrasses are doing for us that a lot of people maybe don't think about or don't intuitively understand just by looking at it. The first is that they are actually doing a lot to increase the clarity of the water. So if you've ever gone scalloping over seagrass, we like to snorkel in this clear water because we can see well and we can find the scallops better and it just feels safer to snorkel in clearer water, right? Um, and because of that really extensive root and rhizome system that the seagrasses have, they're knitting together and trapping a lot of sediment. And also the leaves in the water are working to stabilize those sediments and reduce the ability of currents and waves to resuspend or kick up sediment and cloud the water. So seagrasses are very good at, at keeping the water clear and that helps them uh, survive and persist. So when you have a large intact seagrass meadow, it's actually reinforcing the conditions that it needs to survive there by keeping the light environment good. And uh, that's actually one of the main barriers to reestablishing seagrasses in an area is that you don't have that mat of roots that's keeping the sediments. And so we get a lot of wind driven, you know, cloudy water events that that really make it hard for seagrasses to come back into an area once it's lost, which is why we should really focus on preserving it in the first place. Another uh, thing that seagrasses are doing is they're cycling a lot of nutrients. Um, they're, they're doing a lot with the nitrogen cycle. It's, you know, it's kind of dry, so I won't go into it, but just suffice to say, they are treating the water and they're absorbing a lot of nutrients and they're turning over a lot of nutrients and forming the base of a really nice food web based on that. They're also capturing carbon. So through their photosynthesis, they're, they're hanging on to a lot of CO2. They're shuttling it down into their root system. They're trapping it there. And through their photosynthesis, they're also releasing a lot of oxygen into the water, which helps all of the critters that are living within the blades of seagrass survive and do well. And then of course, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I think a lot of people find seagrass meadows beautiful and they of course attract a lot of recreational activity and a lot of value in terms of fishing, scalloping, and just general you know, enjoyment of our coastal waters. Um, so those are just some of the top functions. I could probably think of a few others, but those are really the main ones that I like a lot of people to understand that seagrass is doing more than just forming habitat. Um, but unfortunately, it's also one of our most threatened types of marine habitats that we have. Uh, they're you know, on par with the level of threat that coral reefs are facing, that rainforests are facing. So when you think about some of the most threatened habitats on, plant, on the planet, seagrasses are right up there. And um, unfortunately, it's because they live right next to the coast, they're right next to a lot of human activity, and they are the end recipients of every bad decision that's made on land, and then even some bad decisions that are made in the water. Um, so we have the leading threat to seagrasses worldwide and in Florida is um, reduced water quality. So that's mainly driven by algal blooms, but sometimes it's sediment runoff. Um, but anything that acts to reduce the light available on the bottom of the seafloor is going to really harm seagrasses and it's going to cause them to decline. They're pretty resilient to short-term reductions, like things that are maybe caused by a hurricane passing through or something like that. But prolonged and repeated algal blooms like that we've seen in uh, the Indian River Lagoon, for example, they are, are very counter to the survival of seagrasses. We do have some other uh, stressors going on related to temperature. As the sea surface temperatures increase, it ends up 
uh, increasing the respiration rate of seagrasses faster than it increases their photosynthetic rate. So basically they, they have a harder time breathing, if you will, when in hotter water, and that causes them to sometimes become more susceptible to grazing. So a lot of things like to eat seagrass and when it, the water is hot, it can make it easier for those grazers to eat more of the seagrass. So uh, there's a, just some sort of chronic stressors that are getting a little bit worse over time and just making it a little bit harder for them to survive other things that are thrown at them. Um, and then those are both, you know, pretty large scale problems that we all can have a role in helping to address. But another problem that's happens on a smaller scale, but is actually becoming quite large in Florida because of the number of boaters is physical damage to seagrass through what we call propeller scarring. And that's the image on the far right here. Um, this is a popular boating destination off of Citrus County, which is a, a fairly rural county, um, but we see just really a lot of evidence of boats interacting with the bottom. The propeller, you know, the boat is running in water that's too shallow. The propeller dredges what we call a scar through the seagrass. And um, I just wanna kind of give you a little bit of a closer look at this issue. So um, you probably can't see the scars very well in this. So I've traced them on the next slide, but this is a Google Earth image of about a nine acre area. And I apologize, there's a, uh, the some of the text is overlapping on this, but I think you, you can still read it. But at any rate, it's about a nine acre area and we have 2,600 linear feet of scars here. And, you know, no one is going to restore all of the propeller scars in Florida, but if you were to do a back of the envelope calculation based on the last time scars were measured statewide, we had about 173,000 scarred acres, and that would cost about $5.6 billion to restore them if you were to use techniques that we have today. So obviously, like I said, no one is gonna go out there and restore every scar, but that was done in 1995. There's definitely more scarring now than there was then. And this is just really becoming a, a huge issue in Florida as boating becomes more and more popular. I read that in 2020, boat sales were at an all time record high in Florida and in other states. And so that just gives us a lot of, uh, more opportunity for boats to harm seagrass. And so one of the things I think that we can all think about doing if you are a boater, if you are going scalloping, is to apply what we call seagrass safe boating. And there's just three basic principles that go into that. The first is to just avoid boating over seagrass whenever you can. Use marked channels, drive as far as you can in deep water before you need to, you know, if your fishing spot or your scalloping spot is over seagrass or in shallower water, just try to plan the deepest water route that you possibly can. And also look at the tides for the day and try to plan the majority of your boating to be during high tide if possible. Or just certainly be aware of when high and low tide are because that will help you be a better um, boater when navigating around seagrass. So the second is when you are ha happen to be boating over seagrass and you can see that it's getting shallower, you should trim up your motor. So tilt your motor up a little bit, or if it's becoming really shallow, you could use your trolling motor or a push pole to get where you are and kind of don't use your motor because the, as soon as the motor starts to interact with the leaves of the grass, you're really only a few inches from interacting with the root system of the grass, which is where the most harmful scars occur. It's also not good for your motor, so uh, you don't really want to be sucking all of that sand and stuff into your intake because it, it causes a lot of wear and tear and um, you could even have some lower unit issues as well. And then lastly, if you do happen to find yourself aground on seagrass, maybe you were having too much fun scalloping and the tide went out on you, and you get back to the boat and you realize that you're aground, um, put some protective footwear on, lift your motor out and push your boat to deeper water. Don't try to power off. Um, if you do try to power off uh, in either reverse or forward, you'll cause what's called a blowout or a blowhole. And that's where the propeller causes a really deep trench and just kind of a general blowout of seagrass and that will never recover. Um, so some prop scars can recover naturally, especially if they're on the shallower side, but a blowhole will require somebody to come in and restore that and it's very expensive. Um, so powering off when you're aground on seagrass is a, is a big no-no. So in, if you're really 
aground and it's low tide, you may have to wait a little bit for the tide to come back in before you're able to push into a deeper water area. All right, so other than the cost that it, that it takes to restore these crop scars, which certainly is a concern, there are a lot of other reasons that we need to be seagrass safe boaters. Um, so the first is that the average scar lasts at least a year. Um, it's not like your lawn where it will just grow back right away. Because remember, these grasses are not like lawn grasses. They're related to lilies. So it would be like mowing your flower bed rather than like mowing your lawn. And then also when you mow your lawn, you typically don't dig down into the roots of the grass, which is really what's at issue here. So it usually takes longer for them to heal naturally. So just, you know, one quick careless action by a boater can cost that area of seagrass a year, usually more, sometimes even up to 10 years to recover naturally. Um, and scarred seagrass is less resilient. It's more vulnerable to being lost, especially if we have a, a a lot of storms hitting the area, you know, we can see, see times where the scars actually start to expand and march outward and storms cause, you know, more damage and more seagrass loss. Um, there's also some evidence that scars degrade habitat quality, but this is depending on whose perspective you're looking at. If you're a small critter that's trying to hide in the grass, the scars create artificial edges and a lot of predators like to to go along edges because it's easier to pick off prey when you're at the edge of, a, of what would otherwise be a continuous habitat. So there, you know, if you're looking at it from the view of the predator, it makes it nice. But if you're looking at it from the view of the, of the little guy, it can degrade the quality of habitat that you're living in. Um, we already talked about how it can damage your boating equipment, which causes a cost to you. And then again, this one is just sort of a matter of opinion, but it kind of makes you sad when you're all geared up for a day in nature and you go out and you just see scars everywhere when you're fishing or boating. And it's just kind of an ugly reminder of, you know, how we have mistreated our seagrasses for many decades. So, um, you know, that just kind of is a bummer when we're out there and we see a lot of scars. All right, so if nothing I said so far, uh, made you care. Hopefully you'll also care because it's the law. If you are scalloping or if you're boating in an aquatic preserve, which all of the scallop grounds now are covered, um, almost all, yeah, all of them are now covered by an aquatic preserve, you can be fined up to a thousand dollars for damaging seagrasses. And uh, so that's just another thing to keep in the back of your mind um, when it comes to seagrasses and boating. All right, I see there's a lot of activity in the chat, so keep those questions coming. But for now, I'm gonna switch a little bit just to talk about, so I talked a lot about the biology and the threats to seagrasses and some of the things we can do, but now I wanna uh, talk a little bit about the bay scallop. So um, the scientific name is Argopectin aradians, and of course they're bivalve mollusks, meaning they've got two shells. But unlike some of the other mollusks that we think about, oysters um, in particular, they're actually fairly mobile. Um, so that, you know, mobile is a relative term. Uh, I guess they're not anchored in place like many of our other mussels and things like that. And clams technically are mobile, but they really don't move much. But scallops actually free, can freely swim in the water column by snapping their shells together. Um, so sometimes they'll try to get away from you when you're trying to capture them <laughs> out in the water scalloping. Um, they are filter feeders and they have those, these little blue eyes are what most people love the most about the bay scallop. They're not tr true eyes, they can't see images, but they are light sensing. And, and this you'll notice if you ever swim over a scallop and you cast a shadow on it, they'll close. Um, and that's those blue eyes are sensing the presence of something looming above them. And they are also hermaphrodites. So they have both male and female reproductive capabilities and they, um, they spawn by releasing their uh, sperm and eggs into the water at kind of synchronized periods. They respond to environmental conditions and often things like cold fronts in the fall will trigger mass spawning events of, of base gallops. So a little bit more about their life cycle. So starting down here on the bottom right, like I was saying, they're broadcast spawners. So they just sort of indiscriminately release eggs and sperm into the water column. And scallop population densities need to be fairly high in order for this strategy to work. So as they spawn, 
there need to there needs to be enough eggs and sperm in the water so that they can randomly unite. And in Florida, they do spawn year round, but this peaks in the fall months. Um, so September through December um, and into the winter is when we see the most spawning activity based on the surveys that FWC has done. Um, so after spawning, the larvae that are formed will drift freely for up to two weeks in the water column, and then they will become settlement competent. They'll turn into a spat, so from a larvae to a spat, and the spat actually settle on seagrass blades. I showed you a picture of that earlier. So they're pretty dependent on seagrass, especially right at this phase when they need to be attached to something so they don't get swept away. Um, and then as they grow bigger, they will eventually detach from the seagrass blades and become a free swimming adult. And uh, most adults in Florida live only one year. Some do live up to two years, but the same species can be found all the way up into Massachusetts and New England. And they, uh, they can live up to four years in colder waters. So their metabolism and their growth is very much driven by the warmer water temperatures that we have here in Florida and that they, they tend to only survive one year. And that's very important when you think about the variation in spawning and population numbers and things like that for the sustainability of the population. Okay, so bay scallops are also pretty picky about water quality, just like seagrasses are. Um, so they, they tend to be found in association with seagrasses as adults, even though they don't actually need the seagrasses as adults in, in the same sense they do when they're small. Um, but they're found in association with seagrasses because they tend to like the same conditions, those low turbidity, you know, they don't like to have to sort through a lot of crap when they're filter feeding. So um, they like to have waters that are relatively clear, that has enough food for them, but not so much that their gills start to get clogged and things like that. Um, they're also pretty picky in terms of salinity. They need salinities that are 20 or more, and 20 is really a minimum. They like it to be a little bit saltier than that. Uh, so um, again, seagrasses and scallops are a match made in heaven because they like the same types of water quality conditions. And seagrasses tend to also be a good place for scallops to hide. So some of the threats to our scallop populations, a big one that we've seen and if you actually look historically in Florida, you'll see that we used to have bay scallop fisheries from Pensacola all the way down to you know, Charlotte Harbor area. And the scallops have been lost from a lot of those areas and we're not able to have a fishery in many of those areas anymore, in part because of seagrass loss, but also because modifications in the watershed that cause rainfall events to release these huge slugs of fresh water out into the estuaries and a lot faster pace than they used to. So as we see the increase in impervious surfaces, so like roads and paved and roofs and things like that, we get the fresh water that falls on those surfaces, they get shuttled out to the coast a lot faster than they naturally would be had they fallen on um, you know, a forested area or something like that. So because of that, heavy rainfall events can really be detrimental to trying to have scallops live in an area because when we get those sharp drops in salinity that result from that, um, it goes below their salinity tolerance. And even though they can move, they're not able to move that fast. So they can't outswim a, a freshwater plume coming out from a lot of these urbanized watersheds that are directly next to the coast. So that's why rainfall is a big threat to scallops. I mean, seagrasses are a little bit better to, able to handle that because their salinity tolerances are wider. And as long as it's not a super prolonged event, they can normally last through that. Um, also high turbidity is uh, just like it's bad for seagrass and it can cause habitat loss for scallops. It's also directly bad for scallops because it clogs their feeding ability and things like red tides or other harmful algal blooms cause low dissolved oxygen that can directly kill the scallops. So they're dealing with a lot of other effects from those algal blooms, not just the, the um, related decline in seagrass habitat. So I know some of you are interested in red tide and the effect on scallops. Uh, the scallops can survive red tides. They don't necessarily get killed by the toxin that's in the red 
peptide, they can filter it and eat it. And, you know, humans should not consume shellfish, obviously, from those waters. But what really gets the scallops is if the concentration of the algae is really high, they don't like that. And then those low dissolved oxygen. So the red tide doesn't directly, the Carinia brevis itself doesn't directly kill the scallops. But a lot of times we do see broad scallop die offs because of those related effects of algal blooms. And then I have possible over harvest here. So we have, a, I have a question mark. We don't actually have any ironclad evidence that over harvest is occurring. But what we do know is that scalloping has gotten more popular than ever. More and more people are interested in it. It's, you know, that some estimates say that interest in scalloping has at least doubled in the last 10 years but the bag limits have remained the same and the populations have remained the same or even possibly declined because we've had some losses in seagrass in certain areas that have open scalloping seasons. So um, it is possible that we are heading towards, towards a situation where we may harvest too many scallops from certain areas if we aren't careful. And so the next couple of slides will go over that. But I just wanna be clear again, we don't have any direct evidence right now of over harvest, but we do have a lot of evidence of increased effort on the same scallop population that we've always had. All right, so what are some best practices if you do go scalloping that you can apply to try to protect this really special fishery that we have left in only a few counties uh, in the nature coast? Um, so it's, it's really a gem that we need to cherish. The first thing is that you can throw back small scallops. There is no legal size limit for a scallop. You don't have to throw back small ones, but, um, and what I mean by small is anything that's an inch and a half or smaller. So about the size of a golf ball. And the reason behind that is that if it's smaller than that, it probably has not grown large enough for its uh, reproductive organs to develop, which means it probably has not had a chance to spawn yet. And normally when we think about fisheries management or really any wildlife population, we wanna make sure that they have at least some chance to contribute to the next generation. So throwing back small scallops will help ensure that more scallops get the chance to spawn before they are harvested. Um, and because scallops in Florida tend to only live a year, uh, for the most part, this becomes even more important because our harvest stock then becomes our spawning stock. Because if you are paying attention, you will know that the primary scallop season is during the summer and their primary spawning season is during the fall. So um, that kind of just opens them up to a little bit more to risk of um, having population sizes that are too low to have successful spawning. So we need to be careful. Um, we also want to only keep what we're going to eat, even though the bag limit for scallops might be two gallons per person um, in the shell, you know, and that that may change. But for now, that's what it is. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to eat that much. So one limit is about four servings of scallop meat based on um, uh, USDA recommendations for seafood consumption. So you know, just kind of do the math and figure out how many scallops you think you'll be able to eat. And then also remember every scallop you, you pick up, you have to also shuck that in order to get to the meat. So I've definitely seen situations where, you know, a big family will come back with their 10 gallon vessel limit and then dad gets stuck shucking all the scallops and he gets pretty sick of that by about gallon five. And then sometimes people just get so sick of it that they'll just dump them out and not even eat them. So just, you know, maybe don't make limiting out your, your goal, maybe just make it to be that you have a couple really nice scallop meals in the freezer. And scallop meat lasts only about three months in the freezer. So just keep that in mind. Um, the other thing is double dipping. We hear a lot of complaints from locals here that, uh, that they see boats getting one limit, going back out, and then getting a second limit. It's definitely illegal to do that. Um, but, you know, some people either don't know or they just willfully decide that they're going to try to collect more than their limit. So just please, please, please never do that. Um, also discarding your shells responsibly. A lot of people will uh, shuck scallops on the boat. You are allowed to do that because you can also land them as meat um, and there's a per pint limit for, as well if you decide you wanna shuck on the boat. Um, so that's, that's a great way to make sure that your shells kind of just stay out, out there in the seagrass in the open gulf. But if you do bring your scallops back on land to shuck them, um, just 
discard the shells in the trash or take them home for craft projects or throw them in a pothole on your dirt road or something like that, but just please don't throw them in boat slips, marinas, channels, kind of these high traffic areas that are important for navigation because we've definitely seen lots of areas where scallop shells will just pile up and fill in those areas. And then also sometimes people will drive up and go swimming in the springs to finish out their day on the water. And, the, and we see people cleaning their scallops in the spring areas and throwing the shells in the water, which creates a really big hazard to swimmers because they are, you know, they can cut their feet. Scallop shells are pretty sharp. So um, just think about that as you, um, as you shuck your catch. We already talked a lot about protecting seagrass while boating. So these are just some of the, the, the ones that are based on the biology of the scallop. There are several other best practices that you can apply that are related to boating safety, using a dive flag properly, food safety, how you store your scallops and how you shuck them. But I don't have time to cover all of them, but there is a link and I gave this link to Shelly and I think she's gonna put it in the chat, but it's we do have a, a great scalloping resource on the Nature Coast Biological Station page that can help you work through everything from preparing for your trip, all these best practices, and then also how some suggestions for cooking your catch and things like that. All right, so just some more, I like to end my talks always with a little bit about what people can do to support these resources that we care about so much. So, um, you know, there's lots of volunteer opportunities out there for things like coastal cleanups and other things that help increase habitat quality across the board in coastal areas. Voting for politicians that can make difficult decisions that end up protecting water quality. There's a lot of really great funding and legislation coming out for water quality recently. And so just keeping the momentum and keeping the pace having people in decision-making spots that understand and care about water quality, because really both of these resources comes down to water quality in terms, to, in terms of how well they're gonna do. Um, anything that you can do also in your own property that ca helps capture rainfall, so having a rain garden or a rain barrel, that helps reduce the amount of fresh water that gets kind of shuttled out to our coastal environments and also can help you conserve water at home. So it's got a twofold benefit. And then uh, installing plants using Florida friendly lens landscaping principles that allow you to use less fertilizer on the landscape uh, because the less fertilizer we can use on land, the less nutrient stress we're going to be sending out to our estuaries. And when we have high nutrients, again, remember we're shifting the competitive balance towards algae and we're disadvantaging seagrasses by doing that. So uh, having low impact plants that don't require a lot of water or a lot of fertilizer, um, reducing the fertilizer you place on your lawn, anything that you can do to reduce your own personal nutrient footprint is going to end up helping seagrasses somewhere in Florida because all of our watersheds flow out to the coast and, and somewhere that potentially could be where seagrasses are living. Um, and lastly, we have some actions you can take right now. So um, we have two pledges that you can take to be one to be a seagrass safe boater and the other to apply scalloping best practices. So these are just really, really quick things. And the reason that we ask people to take pledges is because there's a lot of great research that shows that just through the act of taking the pledge, you're actually more likely to remember that you did that and you want to think of yourself of some, as somebody that protect seagrass and protect scallops. And it will just really help you remember to do that when you're, when you're out there on the water enjoying these wonderful natural resources that we have. Um, so I think that's the end of my prepared content. And I see we have a lot of stuff in the chat. So um, I guess, Shelly, you can kind of let me know uh, where you'd want me to start with questions. Yeah, there's, there's a few questions in there. Um, so there was a comment about horseshoe crabs. I think that was just a suggestion for another topic, unless you want to talk about horseshoe crabs. <laughs> um, I can come back. <laughs> and there was a question about how does the pollen survive in the salt? Yeah, so the from the male flowers, they have a, a coating that makes it hydrophilic. Uh, so that the pollen has a coating around it that allows it to 
to float around in the water and you know they're they're evolved and adapted to live in that salty environment so um, it's just part of their physiology and there's a question are any of the florida seagrass meadows protected and prohibit motorboat traffic Okay, great question. So we call these like no motor zones or pole and troll zones. And there are several areas around Florida uh, that have this uh, around the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge is one pole and troll zone. There's another one around, I think it's called Snake Bite. It's in Everglades National Park. And there are also several in Pinellas County that are around certain county parks or state parks. Um, especially as you get close to several of the islands in around Pinellas County, there are no motors allowed within, say, 300 feet of certain islands. Um, this isn't a widespread strategy in Florida. Um, it does come up a lot when we're talking about heavily scarred areas. Most of what people have done is, is put out informational markers that just warn boaters that there is shallow seagrass in the area and ask them to slow down, but they don't necessarily exclude motors there. But it is a strategy that's been applied more widely in other countries. And certainly, if there's an area that none of the other options have worked to protect the seagrass, it is something that is possible to establish in Florida. It's just not that all that common, but it is around. OK, Irina wants to know if scallops are larger in warm water. Uh, well, they get to their maximum size faster in warm water, but they aren't any larger. Their maximum size is going to be the same no matter the water temperature. It's just more their growth rate that is affected by temperature. They're, the size of their meat can vary based on the food resources in the, in the area. So if they're in an area that has just their most favorite food and the perfect amount of everything, they will get a more uh, beefy muscle. So their, their muscle meat will be larger, but the actual shell itself maxes out, I believe at about three and a half inches. Uh, William asked if FWC keeps track of scallop harvest. He said, I went out two years ago and had poor luck. The guide said it had been a poor season. Yeah, so scallops are very influenced by environmental conditions during their spawning. So there definitely can be bad years and great years. And it's not 100% clear what drives that. But unfortunately, FWC does not have a great way to track the total harvest. So if you've gone fishing, many of you may have been approached by an FWC staff member that asks about what you fished for that day, what you, um, what you caught. They may ask if they can measure your fish. But unfortunately, in that program, they only ask about vertebrates. They only ask about fin fish. They don't ask about you know, lobsters, crabs, or scallops in that program. So there has been some interest in adding scallops to that program because that would help them better estimate the total harvest of scallops. They do have a program where they fly a, a plane and they count boats that are in the scallop grounds and they've counted things like boat trailers at boat ramps during certain times in the season to try to get a handle on that, but it's not necessarily as comprehensive as the harvest estimates that we have for a lot of our other sport fish species. Um, so they do their best, but it's it's been tough for them to gather that data. Um, Deborah asked if walking through a seagrass meadow is also damaging the beds. So a lot of that depends on the underlying sediment. If you're walking in an area where it's really mucky and you can feel your feet punching through and affecting the roots, like if your foot is sinking below the surface of the sediment, that probably is having a somewhat damaging effect. But if you're walking in an area that it's mostly a, a sandier or a, a, a substrate that your foot is not sinking much into, you're probably damaging the leaves a little bit, but it's not as much of a damage as it would be if you're actually punching through into the rhizome. So we, we try to, when we're doing our monitoring programs and our science out there in the seagrass, we try to always snorkel and not put our feet down. We always, it's kind of similar to coral reefs is the less you can touch the bottom, the better. Um, Irina asked if eating scallops from Florida or any other country is ethical. 
Uh, well, I guess that just depends on your personal um, worldview. I think, you know, there's a lot of discussion about whether we should eat animals at all. Um, they are an invertebrate and uh, some people draw the line there. They don't want to eat vertebrate animals, um, but invertebrates maybe are a little bit more um, ethically acceptable to them. So I'll just sort of leave that to the individual person to decide. I mean, they are meat and they are an animal. So some people uh, certainly object to that. But I, I will say on the other side of that, harvesting your own scallops locally, it, it may you know be a more kind of direct food system than some of our other seafood that you can buy that's you know been shipped here from another country that's been processed in a factory i mean certainly you have the boat gas and truck gas that it takes you to drive and launch your boat and things like that um, but the the carbon footprint and the the food system of of harvesting and gathering your own food um, may be something in in favor of of eating scallops or even locally caught fish or something like that but Again, ethics are, we could probably talk about that for a long time. <laughs> okay, uh, Patrick, I guess this is more of a comment. It's just mentioning that there's some non-combustion zones around uh, in Pinellas County. And then Richard asked, what determines the sex of plants or hermaphroditic? Okay, so all, all bay scallops are hermaphrodites. They're gonna be both male and female and they're gonna be able to release both eggs and sperm. Um, for seagrasses, they have, um, some seagrasses have male and female flowers on the same plant, and some seagrasses have male plants and female plants. So we call this either monoecious or dioecious. So dioecious is when you have two separate sexes where there's male plants and female plants, and uh, monoecious is when the same plant could have male or female parts. Um, and that's that's by species. So all turtle grass is dioecious. So they all have either male or female, whereas other other seagrass species are monoecious. So um, yeah, and I, I that's how it works in seagrasses, at least. I don't know if in other plants there are other ways that that's determined, but it's it's genetically predetermined based on the species that they are. Susan asks if you're aware of significant seagrass restoration project in Kings Bay Crystal River. Okay, yeah, I am aware of that. So we wouldn't call that seagrass because it's in freshwater, but I mean, I guess technically it's very similar to a lot of the techniques we would use to restore seagrasses in, in the saltier environments. That is a, a really interesting project because they have the added complexity of manatee grazing being a major impact on the the submerged vegetation there. Um, so they've had to do a lot of different things related to removing muck and reducing nutrients and improving water quality, but also creating havens for the grass where the manatees cannot overgraze, allow them to get established, and then they, they can um, re recolonize the, the bay. Um, but generally, any kind of large scale seagrass restoration almost always has to start with some kind of mitigation of nutrient pollution or improvement of water quality. Um, a lot of times there, people will be very tempted to just replant seagrass, but normally the seagrass was lost from an area because of water quality degradation that needs to be addressed before you can restore the seagrass. And often like they did in Tampa Bay, if you restore the water quality and let light reach the bottom, the seagrasses will actually come back on their own, um, which is what happened in that case. But there are some cases where you really do need to plant the grass. Maybe there isn't a local source for them to recolonize from, but the water quality is good. And you know there are other cases, but that's the general kind of um, point to make about restoration of, of any grass, submerged grasses. Okay, thanks. Uh, Chad asked, hi Chad, um, do you anticipate a minimum size requirement for future harvests? Um, that's been kicked around at the commission meetings. I, I think that the problem there is that if you think about the life of an FWC officer out on the water and they pull up to a boat and they've got 10 gallons of scallops, which is right now the current legal limit for a vessel, um, and they've got to now measure every scallop in that cooler um, or sort through, and that can be hundreds. Uh, it's not very straightforward to implement a size. I mean, there you could maybe envision some sort of measuring device where you could pour scallops through and they would, you know, I don't really 
know exactly how they would do it, but it would just be logistically so difficult to implement a minimum size. I, I, you know, it, that decision is up to the FWC and up to the managers in Tallahassee that make that decision, but the arguments against it are pretty strong and there are other things that they could do instead of the size limit that, that are probably more palatable and easier to enforce. Okay, Brent asked about walking in the seagrass, but you already answered that. So we'll move on to Victor's question. Any comments on the situation of sea urchin overgrazing seagrass in traditional scalping grounds? Sure, so, um, you know, this is kind of an issue that's come up several times over the decades and it's an ongoing issue now in Taylor County and also in um, Gulf County of St. Joe Bay. And sea urchins periodically will have good years and bad years, just like scallops. So sea urchins can have huge increases in abundance and then they graze on the sea grasses and that causes what we call an urchin barren. And this can actually happen in kelp forests too. Um, sometimes it's caused by whatever the predator of the urchins is having you know, a bad year or is being over harvested so the urchins can grow out of control. Other times it's just sort of a natural process where a lot of urchin larvae happen to be swept in inshore that year. Um, so, so generally in the past, what we've seen is that these blooms of urchins will happen, they'll overgraze an area of seagrass, and then the urchins will kind of die off and go back to normal levels, and the seagrasses tend to recover pretty quickly from that, as long as the grazing event isn't, you know, repeated and over a very long period of time. You know, there, the turtle grass that's in question here in the Caribbean is grazed by sea turtles in a very similar manner where the sea turtles will clip off in the entirety of the plant and they sort of like to garden and eat the little baby small leaves. And so seagrasses are adapted to have some level of grazing. Um, but as I was saying a little bit earlier in the talk, this increase in sea surface temperature that could be pushing seagrasses to a place where they're more vulnerable to grazing or more vulnerable to other stressors. Um, I think that we could see these urchin events happen more often, or we could see our seagrasses be more vulnerable to urchin grazing events. But in general, they're thought to be a natural process and seagrasses are adapted to deal with them. And I think any sort of attempt to intervene in that process would not necessarily be advisable. And we also don't have much evidence that it would even help. Okay, so we've got still four, four minutes or so left keep answering questions. I am going to launch a poll really quick if you want to go ahead and uh, respond to that while Savannah keeps answering some of the questions. It is anonymous. It's just a few questions about um, if you learned anything today. So um, next question is seagrass. How is seagrass doing in St. Joe Bay? I noticed a lot of sand cover after Hurricane Michael. Yeah, um, the seagrasses in St. Joe Bay are in a really interesting situation. So they've got a pretty high salinity. Right now they've got a ton of urchins grazing them. There's a huge increase in green sea turtle populations in St. Joe Bay um, that are grazing a lot on the seagrass. And then now they've also been hit by a really significant hurricane. hurricane. And they've also had several algal blooms. They've had red tides that have caused them to need to close their scallop uh, grounds temporarily and then they had some other harmful algal blooms that occurred after that. So this is a case of multiple stressors uh, certainly. St. Joe Bay has had the seagrasses there have had a very tough row to hoe over the past uh, decade or so. Um, I don't know, I haven't seen a report. They do issue routine mapping reports on St. Joe Bay so I'm not sure if there is um, a definite declining trend up there, but I honestly wouldn't be surprised. They also have a lot of seagrass scarring there. Um, so I, I apologize, I don't know the exact answer, but I do know that those seagrasses have had lots of reasons to be stressed in the past several years. Um, I can probably find out the answer, or if you want to look at the, the Florida FWCs, that's called the Integrated Seagrass Mapping and Monitoring Program. And they have publicly available reports where they issue the latest maps and trend reports for seagrasses all around the state. So I encourage you to check that out. 
Um, William sharing some information about eyes on seagrass program, citizen science program to measure seagrass and monitor algae. Yeah, that was started in Charlotte Harbor by one of our Sea Grant agents, Betty Stogler, but it's expanding to other areas in the state, I believe in Taylor County, possibly with Victor. And then also I know out in Pensacola, they've got a program. Um, so check into that, um, Eyes on Seagrass. Yeah, it's a great, great program. And we also do a lot of seagrass monitoring here out of the Nature Coast Biological Station, especially in Citrus, Hernando and Pasco counties. We've got a seagrass monitoring program, um, as do the other aquatic preserves in the region. So there's a lot of people that are measuring seagrass and keeping an eye on it, both in the water and above from aerial imagery perspectives. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, are other parts of the base scallop besides the abduct abductor muscle edible? Okay, great question. So um, yeah, I kind of glossed over this, but I talked about shucking scallops and when most people shuck them, they remove the guts and they only eat the adductor muscle or that little white round meat that you're used to seeing if you've ordered scallops at a restaurant. So I've never personally tried this, but I have heard that people will make uh, dishes that include the entire scallop, similar to how people may eat clams or oysters. I think the most important thing to say about that is if you are going to do that or try that, you certainly need to cook the meat, cook the, uh, the meat because scallops are allowed to be harvested from a pretty broad area. They aren't as heavily regulated as oysters and clams and in that they, you know, oysters and clams are only allowed to be harvested from waters that have below a certain level of fecal coliform bacteria count. And that's for, you know, public health and safety of consumption. But because most people only eat the muscle of scallops, they aren't subject to the same level of regulations. So if you do decide that you wanna eat the gut loop and the gonads and all of the other stuff, just make sure that you cook it to temperature. Okay, and we'll wrap up with this final question. If we do quickly, what is the success rate for restoration plant efforts, specifically seagrass plantings? Um, yeah, so this is kind of a complex question, but since I have to answer quickly, I'll just say a recent report came out that said that, especially when you're looking at small scale restorations of things like scarring and blowholes, the success rate is something like 50 to 75%. But if you look at you know, other types of restorations that uh, the success rate is much lower and actually you know, more broadly seagrass restoration has a pretty poor success rate. Um, but we've gotten better in recent years and specifically in Florida, we are outperforming kind of the national or global average in terms of seagrass restoration. Um, but a lot of it has to do with just the complexity and the sheer scale over which we need to do it. So it's really hard, it doesn't always work. In fact, sometimes it, it fails more often than it works. And we really just need to focus on protecting water quality and getting the existing seagrass the protection that it deserves and keeping it there in the first place. Okay, thank you so much, Savannah. This was fantastic. Um, lots of great questions from everyone. So thank you for also participating and contributing to that. Um, this video again will be shared online on the blog if you want to share it or watch it later again. Um, if you have questions for Savannah, I'm sure she'll be happy to um, hear from you later. She has her email there on the screen. And um, thank you for joining us. Uh, next month, we'll be back. We will be talking about reducing wildlife conflict in Florida communities. We'll be joined by the senior wildlife assistance biologist from Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So that should be really informative. And then in August, we're gonna be talking about genetically modified mosquitoes. So that should also be an exciting topic. So thank you again, Savannah. Thanks everyone.